kids today with the versatility. You are so hot dogs and clams. <laughs> Hello, lovers. This is And Just Like That, The Writer's Room, the official companion podcast of And Just Like That from Max. I'm Michael Patrick King, writer, director, and executive producer of And Just Like That. And I'm here today with executive producer, writer, and director, Julie Rottenberg. Hi. Writer and consulting producer, Susan Fales Hill. Hello. And supervising producer and writer, Samantha Irby. Hello. Hello. Okay, here we are. Getting to what they call the penultimate episode. Is that correct? Is that the episode yes. before the big yes. thing yeah, happens? Yeah, it's like Erev. So yeah, this is episode before. 210 called The Last Supper, part one, or what we like to call in the writing room, the appetizer to the main course, <laughs> which is part two. I am a writer who always goes a little bit further than the page count that's allowed. So anyway, we have these great characters and we spent so much time just trying to believe them and to give everyone a life. Our real missive this season was to open up the book of each character and show more and more of their life. So not only do we have the seven characters that are considered the thrust of the series, we also now are servicing our beloved other characters, starting with Steve, played by David Eigenberg. And one of the kind of infuriating things in the critical reaction that we got last year that bothered me was that people thought we... I guess, ran a truck over Steve. And emasculated him. In the writing room, we made him somebody that was a throwaway. Mm -hmm. And there's no one, I really think, I just love Steve. Mm -hmm. No, we love that character. And, and to show the complexity of his grief, because he's a brokenhearted man, but he's not completely defeated. No, we wanted to leave him with dignity. So we had this idea. And agency. It was his idea to open this mm -hmm. place on Coney Island. And more than just Steve's idea, this is a really interesting example of writing and acting, working together. David, who I've worked with since Sex in the City, created the character mid-season two or three or four, I don't remember, when I was pitching him what we wanted to do, we wanted to give Steve a noble ending. David said to me, I, uh, I never do this, but could I write you something of a thought that's been going through my mind? And I said, sure. And he sent a text about Coney Island. And he just is like, I just have this feeling that like... <laughs> I don't know that Steve went there as a kid because I used to go there as a kid and there's this one restaurant that I really kind of can't stop thinking about. And he was like so apologetic. And, and I think he thought that the writers were going to humor him. But when he showed me, he had a picture of that place on the phone. When he showed it to me, I was like, I brought it to the writing room and yes. I said, what about Steve opening a clam place on Coney Island? And everybody was like, we loved it. Yeah. yeah we well, and it. it's so emblematic of him, the character returning to his roots and accepting, I am who I am. I embrace who I am. As he says, I'm so hot dogs and clams. And Carrie recognizes him and says, you are so hot dogs and clams. The other interesting thing about why this scene exists is because another actor on the show, Sarah Jessica Parker, said to us, will I have a scene with Steve? She loves her Carrie Steve scenes. They're they're few and far between. Last year and in just like that, they had that scene where they were painting. Scene. Oh my God. Yes, and, and he, he tells her, "I'm never taking my ring off." So then, you know, as writers, you're like, "Okay, I bring, I bring I bring to the room. The I go Carrie and Steve. What what can we do?" And then it becomes, "Well, what about Aiden?" Because the audience yeah, remembers and, and they had their own relationship. I I feel like I like when I picture the scenes we don't see is that Aiden and Steve have been in touch. Like yeah, I feel they like had they've been thing. friends the whole time. Well, and this is such a nice corollary to what that. Very Susan? tragic. The scene at the, in Coney Island where Steve is sh proudly showing his new place and he's come back into his own. It's such a beautiful counterpoint to that scene last year where he was shattered. Yeah. This and is saying, I can't, I can't move on. I'm never moving on. Yeah. And he says, I thought about it. I figured it out. Like our characters, when we do good characters, they grow somehow through the exposure to the other person's dysfunction or journey or whatever. <laughs> they have to either man up or, you know, 
died. Would that more people would do that in real life. Yeah, right. <laughs> and also it gave Not us kidding. the <laughs> plot point that Carrie has this scene with Steve, knows what's going on with him. They're in touch. They're up to speed. And then she's again in this middle position with Miranda. And it's sort of this awkward Oh, you went and saw Steve, and and I, I I love in that scene that they come just up to like, are you annoyed that I went? I'm I allowed to be annoyed? Like it's very it's uh, fraught. Yeah. And before we leave Coney Island, we have to say that it's the introduction of the second problem point with. Why? Why it? Um, I was just gonna. I hesitated because I want to tell people if you haven't seen. Mm. This yeah, episode, we've already The Last ruined Supper, it. Part One, The Appetizer. Please turn off now because we're still within the safe splash zone <laughs> of spoiler alerts. You're you still, can still turn you can back. Still, you can still know about Coney Island and not know what's going to happen. But Wyatt calls his dad, FaceTime, and it's just, can you come home now? Which I have to say, like, as a parent, I mean, I'm both, uh, 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 I feel both wrenched like the gut wrenching feeling when your kid is unhappy and it's the last thing you want to hear um and i love that aiden is just he's unflappable and he's used to this and he's calm he's in control he takes it off to the side but you just feel you know what that feels like it's like don't well, I'm having a great day. You just ruined my day. Don't <laughs> Sorry. ruin it. You're only Maybe that was me. My as child. the happiest child. No, every parent <laughs> in the room agreed with you. And I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the look on Carrie's face because when she when right? when, when like, Wyatt oh God, calls again, again and she if you look at Sarah Jessica in this scene, she just has that very subtle shift of an eye that's like this is not easy going for some reason. Yeah. And she's already yeah. learned from Kathy that they consider Wyatt their little puzzle. Well, here's another puzzle piece. Can you come home now? And, you know, the arrangement has been one week in Virginia, one week in New York, and he just got here. And now the kid wants him to come home because of a problem with mom. My favorite thing is when the kid says, it's mom, she's being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Although happily, I have to say his father does correct him on that. <laughs> Says, "Hey, he's hey, like, come hey, on now, like, come like, on yeah. now." Right. Puts a little um, boundary up. We are a room of people who respected our mothers, so we don't. But the end of the scene is triumphant for all three because they're all starting something new. Steve's got this new place, and Carrie and Aiden are starting their new journey in their new house. And Carrie says, he says, how's your place is all going now? And she goes, so far, so good. Knock wood. So then we go to something that we have never really done before, which is four ladies having lunch. And then at a vegan restaurant. At a vegan restaurant. <laughs> that was in, that's new. definitely oh new. <laughs> and then they split and go two different ways in two different scenes, like you do in life. You split away from like if you're a group, and then two people walk this way and say something, and two people walk this way. But the first part of the scene is the vegan restaurant where you find out that Carrie has won a raffle. At a school auction. I can't tell you. She says, I never win these things. <laughs> I'm into you guys for millions of dollars. Because <laughs> we've all, I haven't talked to you for that For school raffles yet. for people so, with kids. Oh, my God. I have never yeah, won anything. And all my friends that have kids are always saying, you could win a car. <laughs> you can, a trip to Greece. I could win, I could win a I bankruptcy would. lawyer if you keep having more kids in private schools. <laughs> It's crazy. So Carrie wins a dinner, which is very true to what that is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They either do a it at auctions. Home cooked a chef, chef, Michelin, Michelin, star. Michelin, Michelin star chef prepared meal at home. What a dream. Yes. This idea of a goodbye party came from you, Susan, yes, correct? Yes. It's a, a dear friend of mine was uh, leaving the apartment in which she had raised her family. Uh, and actually she was widowed. And she had a farewell party, which I thought was such a poetic thing to do because the spaces we inhabit really become a part of us and a part of our families. So it seems suitable to do a kind of ritual of goodbye. Yeah. And the minute Susan said that in the room, I was like, well, that's an amazing thing. And the other thing that happens in the lunch vegan scene is that Charlotte is being badgered by her children. 
It is important because, you know, I am able to think about what I want to do all day. I don't have kids. And you people are leading full lives with jobs, and your kids are constantly asking you for things. And this is the first time Charlotte says, it's a Saturday. I mean, this is a scene about a woman claiming her time, even with a busy family and a career. Her friends are still important to her. And Lily invades that with something we don't know. I, I think it's one of the hardest things to do <clears throat> as a mother is set that boundary. And the I think the, the big crime of the modern mother is that we don't set that boundary and we constantly will stop everything 100%. for the children, which our parents didn't necessarily do for us. I realized <laughs> the original series, I remember it being said that the real fantasy wasn't the fabulous apartments or the shoes or the clothes, it was that they had so much time to have these breakfasts and brunches and lunches. And I feel like what we did in this series is they're having a fabulous brunch, but the reality of the phone ringing and your kid needing mm -hmm. something is there. Yeah. And, and as Susan said, Charlotte drew a boundary and you see that thing that we all seen, we've seen the friends see the mothers yell at the kid, quote unquote, yell. And you just see Miranda going, we don't want to, you know, they're trying to make a joke out of the fact that Charlotte drew a very hard boundary. And Carrie's just like, it. I'm out. <laughs> Carrie's just leans back and is like, I have no idea what to do with this because I have three mothers at the table and I'm just here for vegan zucchini chips. Yeah, childless people got to tap right out as soon as uh, kid stuff comes up. <laughs> dangerous territory. But that's actually one of the strengths of our room is that we have this dialogue between those of you who are not parents and those of us who are. It's a and mixed, you give us a perspective. A mixed marriage, a writer's room. <laughs> and then, you know, of course, what's really interesting to me underneath this scene about Lily calling and motherhood and whether you're allowed to create boundaries or not, LTW is sitting there secretly pregnant and no one knows except the audience right. <laughs> who watched the last episode <laughs> and Chris Jackson. The so the reality is she's sitting there he's seeing motherhood and Charlotte says, ever since I started back to work, it's like they're regressing. And then LTW in the next scene with Charlotte, when they're talking about this great opportunity she's had that PBS is making her documentary, The First But Not The Last, into a 10-part series, which is a giant accomplishment. Yes. So the thought behind the series that's been commissioned is that it's about Black women who were the first to accomplish something. So, you know, we start out with Constance Baker Motley, who was the first Black female federal judge and argued actually Brown v. Board of Education at the Supreme Court as a very young woman. And then it's going to expand beyond that. So it's a hugely important piece that she's been invited to do. And, and as, it's a win. We wanted to give her a victory. Win. And this is a woman who has put her career on the back burner to raise these three children and be the, the helpmate to her hugely successful husband. And there is always a lead career in and a marriage. It, and as aspirational as this job is, I do feel that we argued in the room that it was realistic, that after this documentary was received very well, that where the, the culture is right now, that she would be Ken Burns. They would say mm -hmm. there's a need for this. No, because there's yeah. so many hidden figures. And she her focus is on names that are not marquee names. These are hugely important women in history, but people don't necessarily necessarily know them the way they know Rosa Parks. So she now has this great gift of something that she's sort of been hoping for and while working toward working towards subliminally, especially this whole season, realizing and her and Charlotte, after they break off, go into a beautiful kitchen store and Charlotte starts telling her how great it is. And she says, don't mention it in case it doesn't happen again. And then she, And I love that Charlotte, it's so rare that Charlotte's like, uh, no, no I'm, I'm going to be telling everybody. Shouting it from the rooftop. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, LTW Reality. drops the bomb. Yeah, and pregnant. Charlotte, it's interesting because LTW doesn't say anything at first. Mm -hmm. Charlotte's saying, this is great for your career. She mm -hmm. says nothing. She doesn't break. Mm -hmm. This is great for your Life, you've worked so hard, doesn't break. And then when she says, think of all the unsung black women heroes that you'll get to tell their story, mm -hmm. that's when LTW breaks because that's the, the mm -hmm. big sadness to her. And she says, I'm pregnant. And Kristen's, Charlotte's look is shocked. And we, we, talk, we talk about her age. We make that joke about 
on the border. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Well, <laughs> by the way, any pregnancy after I think the cutoff is 35 is called a geriatric pregnancy. Yeah. So yes. I was a Methuselah pregnancy. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're but, with you. Um, <laughs> also, though, this was an opportunity to explore the biggest myth foisted on the modern American woman, which is the myth of balance. There is no balance between your career and your family. There's something is always out of whack. And it's a very realistic exploration of how am I going to do this? Even though I have help, I have money. Children, as uh, Catherine Hepburn said, can't be tied up to a tree <laughs> like a dog. We really wanted to address the fact that this is a wealthy woman who would have help. And yep. like, I, I didn't want people like throwing tomatoes at the screen being like, what are you, what are you worried about? Because let's face it, even the wealthiest women who work, it's a lot. There's, you can't outsource emotional um well, and we've shown Supports. her as a very hands-on mother. And the interesting thing is it's the first time that somebody says something to LTW that she then hears from Herbert, which is, I think you can do it. Mm -hmm. Your friend telling you you can do something. Is that helpful or hurtful? You know? Well, we debated that line. We debated that that idea because you're taking your cue from your friend. So... It was the idea of would Charlotte, sometimes you feel like, does your friend need permission to not have this baby? What I loved about that moment, though, is she starts with her pom-pom saying, you can do it. And she has LTW up on the pedestal. You've got this down. You've got your routine down. You can manage this. And LTW really revealing, no, I can't. I am not succeeding. I'm going to fail at this. And that vulnerability, in this episode, we see a lot of vulnerabilities that we haven't and seen. Fear. And it's just kind of a conversation and a debate within the writing room that I was able to just take and put into the script, which just shows you how a writing room works. I mean, somebody's name is on the script, but I don't have children and I don't worry about the boundaries between my children. And I surprisingly have not suddenly been pregnant but um except with, except with an idea but there's um, still time there's... i think in ltw's case you know the window is very small when people are going to pay attention to you and if she's caught someone's eye it feels like you got to strike while the iron is hot but in general Life is just much more exciting when you take a flying leap into the unknown. Wow, that's exciting. Like, let's exciting. try it. What's the worst that could happen? And if you look at the way the scene unrolls, it, it's pretty amazing what Nicole Ari Parker does because there's so many traps of how to play this histrionically. And in the writing room, we tried to pull back as much as possible and not make her overly zealous about, I can't do this. And she just touches the emotion. And then when Charlotte says, do you want to talk about it more? She laughs it off and says, I, I want to go home and take a nap. Yep. And what's so great about Nicole's performance is that it's everything you want it to be. It is a well of emotion, but it's not overwrought. It's, it's contained. just the tip of the iceberg that you can feel, but a real person wouldn't show it, especially LTW, in a houseware store in the tin building. No. She's... Until she goes home at night and is pounding the pillow because she can't sleep. And she asks her husband my why he didn't get that vasectomy. Scene. And he's like, eight years ago? <laughs> oh my well, God. we also know that Herbert would never have a vasectomy. I think he humored her back in those uh, years. Yeah. I and mean, we talked a lot about why he didn't get one. And we put it all in the scene between the two of them. And then it comes to the very important part of the scene that was very important to the women in the room was his saying, after she says, I thought my life was starting, my career, <sighs> you made a mistake. And then he says, well, should we be having, we made a mistake by not having you have a vasectomy. She says, he says, well, should we be having the other conversation? Should we be having the other discussion? It's your decision, Lisa. Whatever is best for you, that's what I want. I really appreciate you saying that. So, I thought about it, but I can't. I mean, I'm really grateful that I have that option. I just need to wrap my head around this new reality. And this that was, was very, very important, important to us. And we debated how how to 
approach it. We didn't, we wanted to be true to these characters and what we thought was real, but we also wanted to touch the scary third rail of abortion and, and, and the choice. fact that it isn't legal in a lot of states right now. Well, also that most women who have abortions, 90% of them already have other children. And so the ambivalence about motherhood was a, a brave topic to, to touch on. Um, and, and the reality of what it means to bring another, yet another child into the world, even with all the means that these people have at their disposal. Well, it becomes yeah, really... I think that's the best part is that we always think of, well, not we, but culturally, it's sort of like, oh, welfare moms having too many babies. That's why they're getting abortions. And no, it's not just poor people. No, it isn't. Um, and the decision is a big and heavy one, whatever your financial circumstances. It's also a reach for Herbert to ask that question, which was very important. No, because he's probably a more traditional person. And uh, it's a, actually a very generous gesture on his part, because even the way he, uh, Chris Jackson played it, you could tell it was a painful offer for him to make. And then she says what every really strong character says, I'll figure it out. And he says, you always do. And she says, oh, I always is, do. But it hangs it's such in the a air. Burden. It's both a compliment and a burden, mm -hmm. I think. I hear that's how I hear it. Um, I also loved that every single thing he said to her was wrong. You were a little postpartum. You can't just be a little postpartum. <laughs> I mean, like every, he's trying. You really feel for him. And he's so he's gingerly trapped. Yeah, walking that tightrope of trying to be supportive and say the right thing. And every single thing he says is wrong. Speaking of tightropes and trying to be supportive and walking a tightrope, is Carrie and, and uh, Miranda in that 10 building scene? Yes. Because she somehow feels that she's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> on Miranda by going to see Steve's place. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like that. I want to be very rigorous about like, hey, I did this. Is that I want to be clean about stuff. Yes. So on the record, I went to Coney Island. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she exactly. sort of knows. It's, it's almost like you've had an affair. Yeah. And you have to confess. <laughs> yeah. And so it was, here's Carrie and Miranda walking around the tin building and she's casually going, oh, by the way, I, I went to Coney Island. I never did that. And then she says, of course, I can't. I, and I'm going, oh, Miranda's going to the UN, which is the big thing that starts the scene is Miranda's at the Human Rights Watch, and she's been sort of recognized, yes. which is so thrilling. She's been recognized by Raina, her boss, who's come back from maternity, speaking of mothers, guilt-ridden because she only took five weeks instead of whatever society says you should take. And she tells Miranda, I want you to go to the UN with me. So Miranda's being recognized, recognized, recognized for who we love Miranda as this smart brilliant worker. So Miranda's on this high, and I think Carrie uses that high. Like, you're feeling so good about yourself. P.S. I saw your ass. So oh, yeah, you that's the best time to tell someone bad news is when you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> and then Miranda... Yeah, you know, Cynthia is such an amazing actor. She plays like, oh, that's cool. What's that like? And then Carrie says, kind of magical, which really, I feel, gets under the, 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 the non-emotional, non-airy-fairy Miranda. She's like, <laughs> magical? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. that got, she got, Carrie got away with that. And then she turns the corner, <laughs> literally in the place, and also says, P.S. I'm also going to see Chase stand up set. As long as I'm going You're going to be mad about that, then let me tell you this other thing you might be mad about. So and, and the, she has that wonderful line, Miranda, are you on a tour of the outer boroughs or a tour of my exes? So. And <laughs> Carrie says they're my friends too, which is so important that people remember that this started yeah, with Che, che and, Carrie, and yeah. Carrie's relationship, which Miranda co-opted into a life journey. Right. But it started out as Miranda... <laughs> Miranda's just like didn't even know about Che or Carrie and their continual love affair on the podcast right. and then stole that story. And then the <laughs> other thing is Carrie has a relationship with Steve based on loving him because of who he is with Miranda. So she says, they're my friends too. And it also for us starts pushing Miranda. And she says, basically, you have a Metro card. You can go these places. Don't try to make me feel right, like I'm right, doing something right. bad. Yeah, and, they're your rules. You could change your own rules. Right. 
and then hangs into the air that they're going to Brooklyn to see Che do their first set in a while. And we leave Miranda walking into her apartment with Naya, Naya's apartment where she's living. And she says, the UN says, hi. And Naya says she was invited to Carrie's dinner party. And she's excited because she's, she's salivating a over a Michelin chef experience. And she asks Miranda, who? Do you know who it is? And Miranda says, the only guest I'm worried about is Che because I haven't seen them since the breakup. And will you come and be my wingman? And then right then, Naya gets an email from Andre Rashad inviting her to his baby shower. Now, Samantha. this is a story <laughs> right First of all, for, for everybody, for everybody who's saying he would never do that, <laughs> no. that is a cruel and unusual punishment. We say every storyline in the writing room that you are seeing comes out of a, a gem real. of truth that happened to one of us. <laughs> Samantha had an experience similar to this, not as written as this, but what happened, Sam? Uh, I got a... I mean, truly terrible Instagram message uh, from an old boyfriend, one who broke up with me because of my uh, inability to bear children. And uh, it was like, hey, I, I finally did it. I'm becoming a dad. Here's an invitation to my virtual baby shower. <laughs> now, when you have that as a storyline and Samantha Irby as the purveyor of that reality, it is sort of the, and just like that version of the post-it, the burger left carry. I mean, it's a drive-by assassination. So we're like, yes. Samantha, how did you feel about that? To which she said... He also sent me a link to the baby registry, which I thought was very tacky, uh, tacky, yeah. but hilarious. And so <laughs> only I because went... you're a writer and a comedy writer <laughs> is it hilarious. If you were not those things and you didn't have an avenue, you'd still be laying on the floor. Oh, no, I that's think. true. If if I was a person who did not uh, spin gold out of bullshit i <laughs> would probably have walked into the sea uh never to be heard from again Long and she ago. lives in michigan so that's a walk that's all right well <laughs> oh well we have lake, lake. 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 Yeah. lake. You, i would I, drive up to lake erie and uh anyway and so samantha's it. reaction to what naya should do is what <laughs> Well, she should have done the same thing I did, which was to find the most expensive, beautifulest thing on the registry that you know they would never buy for themselves, oh my buy God. it for them, and have it shipped kamikaze style. I, to love, their house I love the with ambushing. That's like, congratulations. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> I mean, but the part that, that was totally Samantha was, I'm spending the most money so that they know I have money. I might not yeah, have a oh, baby, but I have yeah. money to throw away at your stupid event. <laughs> yeah. It's I want them to open a box for me and be like, she's rich. <laughs> And and little hipster Heidi, the the mother, the baby mama, to in say, our story. wow. Yeah, it, in our it, story. It's like the ultimate um ambushing of generosity, like triple reverse psychology. You know, like, and I'm there's so many ways you can go. And that's how writers' individual personalities affect a storyline. Any other group of writers without a Samantha Irby experience might have taken Naya to her bed. Right. But because we have spicy, <laughs> spicy recipe <laughs> Samantha, uh, right, who or... says, fuck you, here's a, here's the expensive gifts, we get to go there first and avoid the sadness and go into the econ economics of success. <laughs> yes, enjoy your Mercedes of strollers, you <laughs> asshole. And Think it, of me every time you, you... You push your baby up <laughs> uh, your stairs. But the fact of the matter is, what it also, and I want to speak for Andre Rashad because... Yes. Let's explain he can't speak why he did that. Because she over emojied his baby post. Because she was being too gracious. <laughs> she was she being was... a false. She sent woo woo hands and prayers. Oh my God. I believe that was Elise Zizeritsky, who's not here today. So I have to give her a big yeah, shout out. Yeah, she was like, oh she's got to have over instinctively. Over it was such an uncomfortable <laughs> thing for her. She over emojied it. And she says to Miranda, next time I'm going to take your route and cut my ex is off cold turkey. Yep. And Miranda 
is stunned. And Naya is really saying, no, I'm not judging you. I, and she also says, look at me. Yeah, I directly. really like this because Miranda reacts to that because it feels kind of like a, a dig. A dig. Um, and then Naya doesn't shrink from it. She's like, look at me. I'm not judging. Seems smart. Um, and that brings up one of my writing rules in television is if somebody says something hurtful or woundful, even in a comedy, and the other person doesn't react to it, the audience stops believing the situation. Mm -hmm. You have to really have people behave realistically when something hurtful happens. And when, when Naya says, like you do with your ex, is Miranda's throne, which also gets us to the idea that she doesn't want to be that person when she sees that mirror. And Susan? the grain of sand was already planted to become the pearl of wisdom by Carrie saying, right. I am I went to Steve's new place. I mean, she's realizing I'm completely out of the loop with these people. And right. Also, if you hear it from I, one person, you're like, the, you hear, uh, cut them and off. And then you hear it again. Cut a person off is rough to hear. And it could be realistic. So it motivates her enough that she surprises Carrie and Aiden waiting in line at the comedy club for Che's set. Mm -hmm. First time Che's been back on stage. We're in we're in Old Man Hustle. That's the name of the actual comedy club in, in Brooklyn. Williamsburg. I feel very, very, I feel the city is very represented realistically. That is what's happening in Brooklyn comedy-wise. Jess Henderson, who plays the stand-up named Jess Henderson, was very <laughs> instrumental in letting us know exactly what the scene was. And as one, a non-binary right. comic. The other thing that Jess really brought to us as a as a profound truth was the the array of experiences as a non-binary person. And there isn't one voice, which again, I think this show really beautifully demonstrates and was so important to underline. There isn't one spokesperson for the entire experience. And before Miranda walks up the Brooklyn Street and surprises Carrie and Aiden, Carrie takes one more swing at trying to get Aiden into her apartment. This is a storyline that we put up in the Valentine's Day episode that he would never set back foot in there. And we are, and so much so that they rented an Airbnb and now they got kicked out of that. So they're staying at a hotel, but now she's like, Hey, one last go around. And there's a, I only invited 15 people. And he goes, I am never setting foot in that apartment. I love that there's almost nothing else she can't get him to do for her. Like she knows how much he loves her and she knows she can charm the pants off of him, but sh she cannot get this from him. Right. It's just too much pain. It's a boundary. Like it's his one really big boundary he's put up. And she... Lovely invites him She's and okay. he says, absolutely not. And he says, country lurch is never setting foot in that apartment because he tells her, I don't want to sit up front at the comedy club. Last time I went to one, the comic called me country lurch. So they're sitting in the back plot point. Miranda shows them they're so far in the back that Che doesn't know Miranda's there because it's a surprise. And you see that look on Carrie's face. Uh oh, <laughs> this <laughs> might not go well. It's very subtle. If it, if it, it was, was very If subtle. it was a sitcom from the 70s, you would hear this. <laughs> 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 that would actually be also the act break. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> anyway, so there they are. And Che, the che is at the bar working on their set. And up comes Toby, the non-binary character that they have met with the kittens that gave Carrie the kitten. So this person, Che's only told Carrie they're only doing stand-up again to impress somebody. So here's the person they're interested in impressing. But by now, Che's much more interested in right. the set right. than the person to impress because they're fully living the stand-up thought process again. So Che goes on stage, not knowing Miranda's there, and destroys their relationship. This was a journey in the writing room. We were so worried at first we went so vanilla yeah with the I, end of the miranda Che story we, we, right? we took it out we went back yeah, and we didn't back and forth. We it was never written all. they we weren't they, gonna do it right they we had thought like it was no too conflict mean. yes and then when the script at the table reads we were like right. what yes. they came all this <laughs> way and there's no red meat thrown into the well, mix there's right. no there's we, no we, uh, the page bloody... had no pulse. At, at <laughs> one point, we wanted them to have this very grown up, amicable breakup. But then we realized we, that it was so lacking a catharsis of them really, really going at it. But we finally 
came around to like, why are we being so afraid of this? This has been a very mm, that was your explosive storyline for the audience, certainly explosive for us. Yes. And then we just went, let's go back to the idea that Miranda's in the comedy room. And it's a new Che, by the Amazing, way, on stage. I.e. hurtful. I mean, they were mm -hmm. hurtful to Miranda. I think Che never in a million years thought Miranda would be sitting there but and probably didn't does that care. make it, it all right? Even, I know don't that. know. Right. No, I isn't Shay that why would... we all went into comedy though to exact revenge on people who cross? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, and to send expensive strollers. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we did this for. But but the reality yeah. is, I do think Che. You just said Che might not care. Che would, ne in my opinion. Che would never have done those jokes if Miranda was in the room. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Che would have reverted back to some safer material. And I want to point out that this stand-up set is much different than the Che from last season, which was polished and shiny and uh, uh, polemic and, and, and polemic and preachy and like I'm the one and I'm I know everything this chase quietly standing on a stage with a notebook very realistically what stand-ups do when they're working shit out and just sort of not pushing just talking and the audience is instantly there and the extremity of where Che goes was a conversation that we had in the writing room and even in the cutting of the editing, it was like, should we take two of those jokes out and let Miranda leave sooner? And I was like, I don't think so. And I even said to you guys, is it too much? Like, I don't think Miranda wants to leave. That's why Miranda's in that room for so long. She doesn't want to show Che that it hurts right. enough to get face. up and leave. She's sort of like, huh, like I, I'm. Well, and then you get Carrie in the background and Aiden looking at Miranda. It's the most uncomfortable. It's moving. also the most loving and subtextual, yep. and they don't need words, they don't need lines. Oh. But here comes the arena, here comes the red meat. Che goes out there, and Miranda lets them have it. Full on, great, perfect DNA of Miranda. Rage coupled with verge of tears. Mm -hmm. She was in denial about how angry and hurt she was, I think. I, I think I, she was I telling herself that. a story. Yes. And I think Che blew it up yes. because what she came into contact with was Che's story about the breakup, a completely different story than she was telling herself. Right. Che was telling the other story and also ridiculing her. And when Che is going she was all over the LGBTQI map. Mm, yeah. It's true and it's scary. Um, and Miranda is mortified and embarrassed. Yeah. And then she lets Che have it. And Che says, I'm a stand-up. Right. Which is which is, come on, folks. I think it's also difficult for Miranda, just as she is reconstructing herself and finding her voice and sea legs again She's all to dressed have for this the budget. Club. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, I've been at the UN, and I'm, I'm getting my life together to have this mirror held up of essentially a woman in shambles that she was in this relationship, mm. as Che portrays it. So. And the and the great Miranda shows up when. She's leaving and she yells back at Che, where were all the jokes about what a fucking mess you are? And Which what does no Che one say? I love that. I was getting to them. And I and sit we here. Believe it. I believe yes, Che's totally. next hunk was about themselves. Well, also just to hear how someone talks about you when they think you're not in the room is so Ugh. oh my God. It's it's Witnessing or hearing, eavesdropping, whatever, someone talking about you who doesn't know oh you can God. hear them. There's is nothing worse. Like, that's like my worst nightmare. Okay, moving on. Let's get to Charlotte and Harry because Charlotte's gone back to work. And when you when you set up a gallery that's important, 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 important in meaning cash, meaning it's expensive, it is the top line. Because Charlotte used to work in Soho and, you know, kind of young gallerina girls. And, we and now wanted she's it to at, be real and have real art on the walls, yeah, which isn't easy. Now she's at the like the Tesla of art <laughs> galleries on the Upper East Side. And we wanted her to have a success. And we wanted the audience to understand the success by having her sell to a cool person. And the thing we came up with was some cool musician, not, not an actor, but a cool musician. And so Tiffany, our casting person, says to me, this is crazy, but Sam Smith? 
And it was the <laughs> and the day, Grammys. The it Grammys was the said- day after they won the Grammy, and we made one call, and within ten seconds, it was like. I love that show. Yes. Where do I have to be? What do I have to do? <laughs> and we wanted it to be someone also who the kids would be, be impressed, impressed by. by. So, I mean, the coolest really of the cool to do is who had just won the Grammy suddenly was not too busy to come on. And what's great, and you can't really see it, but Sam Smith shows up and they're wearing uh, Sam Smith nameplate nex- necklace like Carrie. Mm. And I said, oh, you have a Carrie necklace. And they said, yes, uh, my three sisters and I, we all have them. Oh, <laughs> Sam Smith was a delight. Yeah, Just completely winning and funny. And that's their stylist, Jeffrey, who's with them. So we said to Sam, if you have anybody you would be in an art gallery with it, they said, what about Jeffrey? And we have to give a shout out to Bonnie, Bonnie who did that hilarious. Bonnie, who plays Leela, is also a, a Tony winning actress. And it's so funny when you get actors that have, I'm going to say, game and you just go, we didn't write any exit for Bonnie. She's just, Leela's just looking at Sam Smith and she fans out for a minute. And then Bonnie and she didn't was know. was a fan. That's what was yeah, so Yeah, and Bonnie great. didn't know how to get out of the scene. And I'm directing and I'm just watching her. And all of a sudden there's just this awkward silence and she curtsies <laughs> to Sam Smith. And then he goes, <laughs> look how cute. She's so cute. <laughs> but it's just seeing Bonnie. And that's what I love what actors do. All of a sudden they're like, well, I got to get out of here somehow. I have to, I don't know what to say well, to the royalty. So I'll curtsy. Back to sort of the theme of the season is showing the flip side of people, even in uh, ancillary characters. She's such a boss girl, mm-hmm. Layla. And then all of a sudden she turns into this fluttering fan. Yeah, no, hilarious. but the great, the great thing about it is that uh, – They're there. Sam Smith is there. And then Charlotte's storyline is real. And the kids keep calling and wanting something. And this is very personal to the writing room. Rock calling and asking for a workbook. And then Charlotte saying, I'm not leaving. I'm selling a painting to Sam Smith. (laughs) And then she calls Harry and says, your turn. Your turn. And Harry's like, I'm in the middle of work. Well, I'm, I'm in the middle of a brief. Well, I'm in the middle of selling a painting to Sam Smith. This is the deal we made, Harry. You said you would pitch in. I have run to that school a million times. Yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm You're the... You're the what? You're the man? You're the father? And I'm the mother? Babe, uh, I gotta go. Rock needs that workbook. It's an emergency. And I love that she catches him in the middle of the most... Uh, Sexist? I mean, uh, the... The goal of <laughs> Harry to suggest that like uh, my job is more important. Oh my God. Which I think is real when you've been used to having somebody who's doing everything for you. And, and the Charlotte most says, she men. I've been to that <laughs> school a million times and now it's your turn. But it really sets up the fact that Charlotte is succeeding and drawing boundaries. And then in the next scene in the gallery, and, the three gallerinas chase Charlotte down and say, you sold the Sam Smith. We need to go for drinks. That's our ritual. And Charlotte's like, no, I got to get home to my kids and family. And then Layla says, girl, yikes. <laughs> you <laughs> are the main character. You're not supporting your family. And then Charlotte hears that and then goes, well, if it's our ritual, one drink. So here we have this crazy scene with Charlotte and three girls in their 20s. And all of a sudden, I'm flashing back to Carrie and Charlotte and Miranda and Samantha in their early 30s doing shots of te- te- like tequila. Like not a care in the world. At a samba club back on Sex in the City. And it's just so fun for me to see the legend continue with Charlotte now she's a, now she's one of the girls and it's all about the roles people are still themselves even though they take on other jobs you're a mother but you're still that girl who drinks too many shots <laughs> and then wildly one too many texts you throw the phone into the margarita yeah, that, pitcher and and by the way the blocking of having it goes right into the picture and then the picture is just whisked off and I love that the scene does not then center around like where looking for phone? the phone no it's no, just like it's over that's it's the end on. and that's over until she walks in the door and Kristen Davis walking oh in that door leaning against the walls for support kicking her <laughs> shoes off at the door first of all you've never seen her take her shoes off that made me so happy certainly well, not and, in the hall in that, we've seen her so pristine and perfect in that incredible <laughs> Thierry Mugler, 
Uh, shout out to the great, late, great Thierry Mugler suit. suit. I mean, when Molly and Danny showed, and Kristen was like, I'm having a suit made, I'm having a suit made. And I was like, we'll save it for the drunk scene because <laughs> you can unbutton it and we could see like the, the black, teddy, the underneath. teddy underneath and you can go from prim to fucked up she so easily in your Teddy Mugler well, suit. And that suit is also emblematic of her evolution because she begins in a pussy bow and the, the puff sleeves and now she She's boss lady, 1940s glamourine. And of course, the, the kids and Harry, the home bodies, run down the hall, and this oh is God. heartbreaking. And also, Kristen's hair. <laughs> At one point, Kristen's hair is just, she's like cousin, chic cousin it. It's just covering <laughs> her face. You can't even see her. And she's like, I did some shots. And the <laughs> idea that her kids are rude to her mom how gross i believe lily says mom you are so gross yeah and i <laughs> we wrestled with that because i there was a moment when i was like uh i don't know that's really because well, we that's, we are blessed with respectful kids yeah, yeah we right. don't then so. meanwhile i went home that night and probably got worse from mine and was like you know what let's keep that <laughs> but you know um <laughs> it's it's interesting because i knew it was a it was a spike and i knew it was and when Kristen was playing it she did the performance great and it was very funny and then i thought but there's more there Kristen can do more oh, that i couldn't believe that because that was i think it was first up in the day she was killing it and you were like no more more, more and it's more. around that line farther. because Kristen has this ability as an actor that if you say something to her it changes what she's doing she really is like an empathic sponge or something. You say something. And I went up to her and I said, this is Lily, your daughter, that you worked so hard to get into your life. The one you adopted, the one you chose to be the, the path for you and Harry calling you gross. It's hurtful. And you can see it in her performance. It just cracks her open. So you get the comedy of the shit face, but then you also get the brokenness of her heart when her kids are telling her gross. And then she pulls it together and tells them They've got to get it together. Also, the three of them, they're indignant that how worried they were about We thought about you were her. dead. <laughs> Even Evan, the actor, he's so flustered. He actually stumbles. <laughs> and then she gives him the, lays down the law and slams that door. And then Richard Burton goes oh down the God. hall. And then she opens the door. She goes, hi, baby. This is my favorite <laughs> Kristen, thing. Kristen will it's like the always one, yes. love a, a, a dog. I, I, I mean, <laughs> Kristen comes onto the set and goes, is Richard Burton in the scene? <laughs> and then one of the unique stories is the Anthony Giuseppe story. Because we have only seen Anthony basically... Rat tat 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 tat. tat. Marty is in control. In control and and pushing things away. Bitchy. Uh, pushing stuff away, like anything that makes them uncom him uncomfortable, he pushes away. So we knew that Mario Cantone could play anything, and we have this amazing Sebastiano playing uh, Giuseppe. So we're like, this is working. From us, we thought it's a gamble. We're gonna bring a a hung poet. <laughs> And Italian. Ho a hung Italian poet and throw him in front of a bitchy, funny, tightly wound comic character. Cynical. And we're going to try to see if we can also evolve this relationship. And when we got the, and you know, we wrote this before we saw the actor's chemistry. So we got very blessed by wow. whoever the, the yeah. acting gods are that Sebastiano came. But uh, so what we have in this scene is that Anthony has finally let uh, Giuseppe in, but not in. And he's he's I, let him in the apartment, but not into his ass. But this one is interesting because uh, I believe that a, a heterosexual people believe that penetration is a done deal or the only <laughs> thing that happens in gay relationships. And how many times people have said, who's the woman? <laughs> to, to to any gay couple, men couple. I who's think the you're woman? hanging around with the wrong yeah. people. No, like, honey. What are you talking about? No, honey, I'm, I'm hanging around. Who's I'm the hanging woman? around. As, as Anthony says, as Anthony says, men of a certain generation see things differently. So we, we come up on the scene where Anthony and Giuseppe have just had anal sex with Anthony being the person on top and Giuseppe being the bottom. And Anthony is 
quite finished. And he goes, you're a wonderful lover. And Anthony <laughs> says, thanks. I know. Nice yeah. to hear that. And, and then he goes, now it's my, now it's my turn to fuck you. And the reality is they have a discussion on what sexuality means to a gay couple. And Anthony admits that he's never had anal sex, um, where he's never been penetrated. Anyway, this is one of those scenes that was fun. Like when I wrote the up the butt scene in Sex in the City, I thought, well, no one's ever written this. And it was fun to write this scene because it's like no one's ever really written this. They've said it and they've talked about it. No, and it's I, instru- it's I like, learned a lot. It's like read more about it. If you like to know about penetration, read more about it. And just like that will tell you. But the idea is... Giuseppe, who is from the younger generation where it's versatility, as Anthony says, you kids and your versatility, calls Anthony out and says, why would you be afraid of more love? Mm. Which is, Anthony says, don't poe at me right now. But yeah, it leads us that. into the next scene with Carrie where Anthony shows up at, at uh, her apartment. And he thinks, he doesn't know why he's there, but he wants to talk about the fact that he's a dinosaur because he's extinct his way of thinking about sexuality. And she says, well, we can talk about your ass in a minute. <laughs> There's a reason I brought you over here. And she got a letter from Stanford. So ever since Willie died, and what we had to do last year was explain away the loss of our really wonderful friend and actor, Willie Garson, playing Stanford Blatch. The thing we came up with is that he went to Japan on a TikTok tour. And it was, I would say it was, it was a band-aid. It was a fast fix. It was a little bit, it was like a thin ice. We skated over it because we had to, because he wasn't in the show suddenly. And we didn't and we want, didn't want we didn't want die. Stanford to die. We wanted Willie to be alive as Stanford somewhere in the world. So we put him in Japan and then we didn't mention him. Talk about extravagance. We didn't really mention him except in the first episode where Carrie says, Stanford sent me a kimono from Japan. Oh, yeah. And here we are. And she says she got a letter from Stanford and he's in Japan and he's staying and he's a Shinto monk. People ask me, oh, why Shinto monk? And I'll tell you personally, uh, I went to Kyoto with Sarah Jessica after the second movie, which I don't know, spoiler alert, was not received well. <laughs> <laughs> by, by the, I still watched it. It's available gorgeous, on but I have had on... growth. Uh, I have had growth, much like <laughs> Naya has growth about the baby carriage, but the critics were not nice to that movie. And we were in Japan and we opened it, and then we went to Kyoto, and I was in some sort of an emotional shockwave. And I was going from temple to temple with Sarah Jessica, I was sitting there trying to release these complicated feelings and I felt kind of peace and Sarah Jessica was just sitting there with me and it was so beautiful. There wasn't tears, but there wasn't, there wasn't laughs. Mm -hmm. It was just like feeling this space in these beautiful temples that people would come in, me, a tourist, I'd come in, I'd light a candle, I'd look at the flowers and because it was Sarah Jessica and I, it always felt more than just me. Mm -hmm. It was quietly us. So when I started thinking like, where is Stanford and what do we do? I somehow tapped into that feeling that Sarah Jessica and I had because I know Carrie and Stanford had a very deep bond. And I'm happy to say Sarah Jessica and I have a very deep personal bond. So I thought, what if you just stayed there in that beautiful, blissful temple and became a Shinto monk? And I did all my research. And you don't have to be Japanese to be a Shinto monk. And you just have to put in some time. <laughs> and then when it said the descriptions were, you facilitate the tourist visits and change the flowers on the altar. I was like, Concierge. <laughs> and this was another thing you had way, 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 way back before we even started the writer's room for this season. It was a great idea. Yeah, I wanted to somehow tribute Willie and put Stanford someplace where it was golden and filled with light because I hope Willie's someplace that's golden and filled with light. And it was poetic and it's very emotional. It, well, and it gives uh, Anthony Mario Cantone such a beautiful opportunity to... Reflect. Reflect, and, and it cracks his heart open, and it takes him out of what you talked about. And here's another writing room uh, tidbit, and how it really works when you have the great writers to work with that you really trust. 
This was originally written by me where Carrie was telling him this stuff from mm. her knowledge of what had happened in a note she got. And Samantha reads the script, says to us and me, Carrie should be reading Stanford's letter and not recalling this in some smacked ass television way. Isn't that the thought, Samantha? Yeah, no one wants to hear, like, your memories <laughs> of what you read. It's so much nicer to hear the words from a His person voice. off a piece of paper. And it so. makes it so much more playable and personal that Sarah Jessica is opening that letter and saying things. And it's the di same dialogue with just he writes added. And that's Samantha's taste. Samantha has a incredibly valuable bullshit detector when it comes to writing. She's like, that's bullshit. I'm not going <laughs> to. I hate that. That's I the hate way she says it. I hate that. I, always say, I hate that. My yeah, she, but this was more gentle, but she was like, it will be so much better if it's not some recalled memory that she's yeah. pulling up, but that it's mm -hmm. actually Stanford's writing and she's reading it. It'll be personal. And it was. And, and st writing wise, we use this opportunity of Stanford setting, letting, letting go of all attachments to start the wheels of Anthony saying, why am I attached to this personality that I've been growing for so many years about what I do and what I won't do? Why didn't he tell me this himself? Um, I tell Anthony myself, but I know he'd make fun of it. Which I just did. Which you just did. He also wrote, my lawyers have enclosed all the legal work needed, the apartment and all of my belongings are now his. I want no attachments. I have let go of all things that no longer serve me, and I let it all go with love. I am stunned. He's let it all go, and I sit here still holding on to things I'm not sure even serve me. Good for him. Good for him. <laughs> to Stanny. And then Sarah Jessica does something that delights me to no end as an actor. I didn't see it coming. When they toast with the Cosmo, the Fulta Cosmo, she says to Stanford, Sarah Jessica chose to drink the entire drink in one gulp. And I got chills. <laughs> I'm getting emotional now because it just was so knowledgeable that Carrie would go to that extreme and get it over with in one gulp. And mm -hmm. she looks at Mario in the middle of it and she winks and then she keeps going. And it is so, I guess the phrase would be baller. Mm -hmm. For someone to drink an entire Cosmo without <laughs> stopping. But it says so much to me about how big that toast is for mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. to Stanford and I think Willie. Mm -hmm. So that's why it gets me. And, you know, when you get into shows and you're like, well, this scene doesn't move the story forward. It could go. You know, people are always sometimes saying, well, you know, not luckily we're very blessed by our studio that they kind of feel it with us. But you could easily say, you know, like when you're looking for cuts and stuff, you're always like, does this move the story forward? How does right, this, right. could we exist without this? Yeah, this story could exist without it, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. But it's also such a beautiful emotional pause, which you need. And it does underscore the entire theme of the season, which is life is too short and here's to life. That's here's to life. And the other great thing about how we get to work together when you work with people you trust, Tim Norman, who is our brilliant director of photography. We were talking about this scene and I said, I want Carrie to feel like she's in heaven. Mm -hmm. So we put her in front of the window and lit her hair golden and it's... She has a halo. She's almost there yeah. when she's talking about it. And speaking of being almost there, Seema is almost there. Wow. Having sex with her new, oddly, surprisingly present Ravi. And while they're <laughs> making love, she does the thing Seema would never do. She blurts out, I love you first. 
Yes. And she immediately, the look on Sarita's face is like something very right. bad happened. She knows, she knows instantly it was wrong. For her. And For he her. says, I love you too. But then she runs immediately to Carrie's apartment where Carrie's packing stuff up yet again. How many boxes has Carrie packed in and out of that apartment? <laughs> For me, it's many. She's moved in and out a couple of times. And this time, Lisette's there, who is the who is the, the beneficiary. The luckiest girl in the As world. As Stephen would say, you're the luckiest girl in the world for the apartment, the price Carrie gave this apartment. And Carrie says, which is important to all of us, I wanted a single girl to have it. And so we have Lisette downstairs and they share a heart, those two. They're, there's a very subtle connection. They're not... It's not being handed off like the baton, but Carrie understands where that is, that age, those feelings after seeing Lizette hurt so much. And she is talented and she is an artist and she dresses well. So Seema shows up and she's desperate to confess to Carrie, I did the wrong thing. I threw away 35 years of smart dating because he was in me and I felt something. And Carrie gives her motto where she feels now after everything she's been through, run the loss of it. big. If you feel love, run, toward run it. at it. And that's what Carrie does with Aiden. She runs at it. Well, and this allows us to deconstruct yet another character. Our femme fatale is showing her vulnerability. And right. we talked a lot about who was Seema and why was she so guarded uh, and so and to, why hasn't she found love? You know, is she in her own way? Yes, exactly. That was a big, big discussion. And also because he was so new to the audience, Ravi, we had to justify that Seema is also saying, how can I feel these things? It's only been three months or five weeks or whatever time it was. Because we also thought, wow, we love Seema. She's so smart. How is she feeling this so quickly? So we had to put a hang a lantern is the television writing term, hang a lantern on it and say, I know this is quick, way too quick for me to feel this. And Carrie says, if you're feeling it, run after it. But she's terrified, Seema is, and we've never seen that color on that character, fear. And then, you know, we leave that scene and we go to this wonderful scene of Carrie and Aiden in bed um, after the comedy club late at night and they're having a conversation and she's painting the future about how great it's going to be. And he says, she says, our place. And he says, repeat our place. And here's another place in writing where an actor who plays the part means something. The day that John Corbett showed up on set for the first time, I went into the makeup trailer and he said to me, I've been looking at the old episodes and you know what? I made a bunch of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's what he's coming in with. He said, I, I think I made some mistakes as Aiden. I, not as an actor, Aiden, Aiden. And, and I was just like, my ears just perked up. And he goes like, you know, like I was trying to make her be somebody else. And I thought, oh, this is a gift. This is something. And so it just rolled around in the writing room for a while. And here is the scene where he says, you know, I told you that you said to Che that you made a mistake. And this is where he says, I made some mistakes. Well, and also a counter to, I feel like in the, now it's been 25 years since the series, people are still angry at Carrie for what she did to Aiden. And I feel like this is the less talked about conversation, which is how Aiden wasn't entirely in the right. He did push her. But that's such a gift when you do feel like you're the person in the black hat in a relationship and you crush somebody that they come back and say, it I wasn't was all not, you. it wasn't yeah. all you. And then in the middle of them reminiscing and Aiden saying all that stuff about how he is responsible for some things. And he admits the reason he didn't go into the apartment, Carrie says, because you didn't want to be hurt that. again. He says, no, because I didn't want to be mad at you. Mm, which is, I love it. It's it's kind of harsh. And he says, and I was wrong about that too. I made a mistake about that because basically I could never be mad at you again. And he gets a phone call from Kathy, his ex, and saying that there's been an accident in Virginia. And again, and this is such a tribute to John Corbett as an actor, he's totally calm, like you see it land, but he's taking care of business. It's and gonna... it's, it's the accident is uh, minimalized in the first expression of it because they say why it broke a, um, a collarbone. He 
crashed my truck into a tree. And Carrie's like, he's 14. And what was that about? And he goes, I have no idea, no details. So he um, says he has to get a, a, a plane. And Carrie grabs her phone to help him get a plane. And then he heads off to Virginia. And the next morning, uh, Carrie's at her new apartment, which you see slightly growing. It's a little more it's life to it. It's a little bit it. more furnished. But as she says to Aiden, the bedroom's finished for our first night after the Last Supper. And he calls, and she's making the bed, and he calls her from the parking garage in Virginia. And he tells her that it's more than a broken collarbone. His ex-wife, Kathy, didn't want to tell him that he shattered his leg, that he was drunk, mm. and that he got mad at his mother and hitched 30 miles to the farm had a few beers and drove his truck into a tree. And then Aiden breaks down. And I mean, whether you're a parent or not, the fear and guilt is incredibly powerful. And John just broke my heart doing that. I agree, Julie. It was very, very resonant. And one of the things I love seeing is... Uh, a beautiful, loving, and good father. And that's what Aiden is, and we love him all the more for it. Yeah, and the fact that it's right there under the surface and that he's finally opening up to Carrie. I assumed that he was very stalwart yes, to Kathy yes. and around the kids. You yes. know, that like, I'm the parent, I'm the parent. And then when he gets in the car and he calls his love, he lets it rip, and she is completely taken aback. And she says, breaks heel. Which, heel. oh my God, I mean, I, of course, had read the script, was there on the day we shot it, but it wasn't until I saw it in the cut that I felt like, oh my God, she needs to make this better already. Like she's, she is trying to fix this awful thing. And then for the first time after Carrie feels through the phone, Aiden's dilemma. I think dilemma, not just emotions. He says, I should have been there. Mm. He repeats it. I should have been there. And you feel for Carrie, it's almost like she's an accomplice. It's like the fact that he was with her is you can't not feel implicated. Mm -hmm. And I think she does. And then she says in the last voiceover, and just like that for the first time, I was worried. Mm. And we wanted to introduce suddenly a, a problem in a real life world of people who have had lives apart from each other. Now suddenly the lives are all coming like the bills showing up. If mm. you have kids, it means something. Uh, you can't be away from them or can you? And it's just a complication that we wanted to drop kick into the end of this episode. And that's why it was so big because we still have so much more to tell in terms of this Last Supper. And you'll hear all about that next week. And just like that, this is the end of episode 10 of season two. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Samantha. We'll be back next week to unpack episode 11 of the series, The Finale. The Last Supper, part two, The Entree. Stream new episodes of In Just Like That, Thursdays on Max. Listen to the podcast on Max and wherever you listen to podcasts. And just like that, The Writer's Room is produced by Neon Hum Media for Max. At Neon Hum, Cher Morris is the executive producer. Joanna Clay is the lead producer. Sammy Allison is our head of production. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Sam Baer is our engineer. That's it for the show. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.